Welcome to Out the Line. I'm Christine Williams, coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints Hour. The conflict in Gaza. Now QP is calling for a boycott of Israel academics and the issue of media coverage. Is propaganda at work? Stay tuned. issues we're presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary and again it's all about Gaza. Israel's daily three-hour truces are being called a glimmer of hope. But here's the latest. Rockets have been fired from Lebanon. And the Canadian Union of Public Employees has called for a ban of all Israeli academics on university campuses here. Meanwhile, the union's president Sid Ryan has apologized for comparing the Jews to the Nazis. And some media coverage about the Gaza conflict, is it promoting propaganda? Now let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Paul McKeever is leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario. And Raheel Raza is a journalist that not long ago returned from the Middle East. And you, the viewer, you are our third guest. Feel free to call in at any time about any, and I'm saying any here, of your comments concerning Gaza. Now, our approach today, we're referring to three specific topics about Gaza. We covered this at length on our last viewpoints, a little bit about the history of Gaza there. Today, we're opening the line so that even though we're talking about a specific angle of this issue that's happening here, that conflict, we want to hear your thoughts overall. So feel free to call in at any time. Your calls are important to us and don't be shy. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Pleasure. Thank you, Christine. Now, as I mentioned, right now, the latest is there's a three-hour truce going on every day and some, some are saying it's a glimmer of hope. It's allowing some medical supplies to flow in and so forth. The latest news comes from a couple of rockets fired from Lebanon. So on one hand, we're seeing a glimmer of hope. On the other hand, we're wondering, well, what's up with this? Mm -hmm. Because from what I'm understanding, both Lebanon and Israel are downplaying this incident. I don't know how the two of you feel about this, because one thing we're going to be getting into today, too, is what projections the two of you perhaps have in mind as to this conflict going on. But I'm going to start with you on this one, Raheel. In terms of what we're seeing happening, some are calling it, the EU have referred to the Israeli defensive, not as an offensive, but as a defensive. There are others that are referring to it as an offensive, and I'd like to know how you feel about this particular matter. Well, matter. First, first of all, Christine, <clears throat> obviously we have all understood that this is a very highly politicized, polarized... And emotional. Emotional, complicated situation. Certainly. Well, everyone has an opinion, and that opinion may be different from everyone else's. And so, you know, depending on who you are, and I think it's, it's important for me to say that for some of us, when we are talking about this issue, in order to have a balanced perspective, we have to move out perhaps of our nationalities and our ethnicities yes. and our faith and speak about this from a human perspective. Now, from your humanitarian perspective, whether it is a defensive or an offensive on part of Israel, the fact is that too many lives have gone. You know, and one life lost is one life too many, whether it is Palestinian or Israel. Agreed. You see, so mm -hmm. so the, we have to look at this in, in, the, in the larger picture. And of course, as you say, they will continue to argue about whether it is any defensive or an offensive. And very often what I've seen in the debates that take place, they start discussing this from 1948 or 1967. And then what happens is that it becomes a debate that doesn't even talk about what's happening right now. So there are many different realities, there are many different truths, there are many different opinions, but there are some facts that remain, and one of them is the fact that Israel has a right to exist and has a right to defend itself. But at the same time, Palestinians have a right to exist in dignity and in equality, just like the Israelis do. So I think that the conversation needs to start here today. As we speak, lives are being lost. Is that important to us? And I would like to have seen Canadian government broker this dialogue to say that let's not have any more lives lost. It is a humanitarian Raheel, everything crisis. everything you've said, I think any reasonable person couldn't agree with that both the Palestinians and the Israelis have a right to exist in dignity. Yes. The biggest question, though, that seems to be 
largely unanswered is how do you attain that when, when there are groups that are saying that Israel doesn't have a right to exist, Hamas is one of them, they've been throwing rockets into Israel on a daily basis, we're seeing deaths there, you acknowledge that it's a shame to have Israeli children and women and the population, innocent civilians dying, in fact it's a shame on both sides to see these deaths. Hamas is also using human shields and those same women and children that are being spoken about here getting killed, they're hiding behind them. What do you do with something like this? What does Israel do to protect itself in the middle of such a conflict and a tragedy? But this is a question that we have to ask the superpowers, the supreme powers, those who are supposed to exist to create this kind, uh, to, to have conflict resolution. The United Nations, which was supposed to have been based on mm -hmm. justice and humanitarian issues, is totally ineffectual in a totally. situation like this. What needs to happen is, well, I believe that the surrounding, the neighbors of Israel and pa Palestine, they need to recognize Israel as a country so that they can have a dialogue. Because you can't have a dialogue with an entity that you don't recognize. See, and again, as I said, while they keep harping back to what happened, the reality is that Israel is 60 years old. It exists and it will not stop existing whether mm -hmm. rockets are fired or not. Mm -hmm. Well right? said. So, 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 so we have to look at the end result. What is Israel going to achieve by indiscriminately and heavily bombing civilians and school children? It's not going to get rid Raheel, of Hamas. I want to get back to you, but what you said about the neighbors is something that we have to address today. There are many questions being asked, like yes. why aren't we hearing from Egypt and Saudi Arabia yes. particularly? Absolutely. And that's something Jordan, we're going to... And South Jordan, yes. and Jordan, those three in particular. Yes. But I want to hear, Paul, how do you feel about this one? Well, just a few things. I mean, uh, I guess on the substance. I, I wouldn't disagree uh, with many of the things Raheel said. Uh, but let's just start at the beginning. I, there aren't many realities as I see it. There's one reality. And we either adhere to it, we either recognize it and act according to it, or we don't. Uh, the only way to, to know what that reality is, mm -hmm. is not to refer to ethnicity or to supreme powers or anything like that, but rather to apply our own you know, senses and rational faculty to an assessment of the facts as they present themselves to, to ourselves, uh, to our senses. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, in when it comes to the morality, when it comes to the issue of defense versus offense, morality is the field we ought to be looking to. Um, clearly here, um, every individual should be free. But not every government has a right to exist. There is no right for a group hmm. of people to form a government that will enslave a people. There's no right to form a dictatorship, no right to form a collectivistic, uh, you know, uh, oppressive government. There is a right to be free of uh, violations of your own life, liberty, and property. What we have in Gaza right now is an, is an organization, Hamas, that, that is dedicated to the destruction of uh, Israel, mm -hmm. uh, that is largely um, uh, collectivist, Mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing collectivist organizations around the world supporting it because it's collectivist. It is not a government that wants freedom for Palestinians. It's a government that wants to form up an oppressive government. And it sees Israel as the sole uh, instance of Western philosophy in the whole region. It is a, an example of everything that they are opposed to. Individualism, people being able to differ in terms of their opinions, express their opinions without going to jail, freedom of the press. Uh, a justice system with an objective system of law. It's not a perfect country. It's uh, socialist, and I'm not a big fan of socialism, as you mm -hmm. probably know. However, there are some basic recognitions, Western recognitions, of the, the individual rights of every human being, uh, regardless of genetic makeup or a peaceful personal lifestyle choice. So I think it's right to say, as Raheel said, we have to put aside ethnicity and et cetera, but the right focus should be on mm -hmm. the individual and morality. Now Hamas would insist that, hey, we were elected. However, it's not quite the way, it's not quite so, but Raheel? Well, they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, again, that is another reality that, we, that the Western world must accept. Because you see what happens in situations like this, that the double standards and the hypocrisy of some of the Western powers and those people who are right there comes through as well. And this, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Paul, that in the, in, in the essence of truth and justice, we can see this. So it's one thing to say that we want democracy in that part of the world, but here you have a democratic elected party and we can't deny their existence. It's already happened once before in the history in Algeria where if that particularly democratically elected party doesn't happen to toe the line, you want to say no, 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 we don't. No, they are.
let's you know again this these there's one thing to have visual thinking but there's another thing which is a reality that exists and this is a reality however mm -hmm. as a democratically elected party they owe a responsibility to their people yes they the do Palestinians and one of that those responsibilities is to look for their protection is to protect them and find the right kind of solution so how have they been faring at protecting their own Palestinian people according to your opinion obviously not very well mm -hmm. because constantly taking pot shots and firing rockets when it is in the interest when, when we did doesn't go in the interest of all Palestinians. And another important point here also is that in this highly polarized debates, you rarely hear the voices of peace from both sides. You know, there are Palestinians and Muslims who don't necessarily accept Hamas's tactics, yes. and they are speaking out. But when you have demonstrations, when you have loud voices who are giving, you know, it's just blame putting, then these voices are drowned out. Similarly, you have Jews and Israelis who are not in favor of Israel's mighty, indiscriminate, bombing of uh, Gaza. So, you know, certainly on both sides there are people who are looking for some sort of balance. And these are the people who need to perhaps find ways in which a political solution can be brokered. Um, I'm always, I'm not sure what context exactly Rahil was using balance in, so I yes. wouldn't want to make, jump on that too much. But I think it's important to recognize that there's a difference between, um, you know, the idea that the, the uh, government represents the governed, which is yes. democracy as opposed mm -hmm. to, for example, theocracy, and the idea of elections. So you can elect a government. That doesn't mean you have a democracy. You may have a theocratic government that's been elected. And I think it's important to recognize that. Now, what is the significance of the fact that Hamas was elected by a majority or by a plurality? Well, it means that a lot of Palestinians share their views. And that's another point. Plus, there were a lot of conflicts around that so-called election to begin with, something we're going to discuss some more. Once again, our lines are open. Your views are important to us. So right after we come back from the break, we're going to get to you. Stay tuned. Hello again, welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're still talking about, in fact, for the whole hour, we're dedicating to talking about the conflict in Gaza. Your opinion is important to us. Feel free to call in at any time and join us. We consider you our third guest. Let's go now to you, John, on line seven. Hello, John, you're on the line. Hi. Go Hi, ahead. Hi, um, Good afternoon to you and your guest. Um, oh, this is so difficult for me. Um, can you listen into the into the phone, John? Don't listen to in, into your TV set. Oh, okay, Christine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this whole thing about a Palestine and Israel issue, this thing is so frustrating and confusing because you know what? Mm -hmm. Keep going, John. Yeah, this whole issue about Israel, that's, that's, that's a whole lame excuse the, the, the Muslims and the Palestinians are making because you know what? They're using schools and mosques and places where little children are a shield so they can have an excuse that, oh, the Israel is, is bad. If Israel is not there, they're going to find some other excuses. John, Just thanks for calling in without opinion. You want to answer to that, Raheel? It's another opinion. I think that, again, we can't move away from the humanitarian issue, mm -hmm. that there are people dying. Whatever the reason, whatever the cost, we have to find a peaceful solution. I don't think we're here to take sides with Israel or Palestine. I think we're here to talk about a huge humanitarian crisis, which has the mm -hmm. makings of a much larger crisis. Let's not forget that if this doesn't stop now, I think it could escalate into a really huge worldwide but global I'm crisis. I'm going to ask this question to the, to two of, to the two of you here. <coughs> Did that crisis just begin? Because obviously when a war begins, it becomes it becomes a media frenzy, let's face it. Yes. But when Israel was receiving these rockets into its territory, killing its children as well, didn't the crisis, in a sense, begin there? Yes, I know it's worse now, because you've got a situation where Gaza is, is cordoned off, so you're not getting proper supplies in to help the wounded, and I realize that puts it into a whole different category. But all along here, we're seeing a crisis happening where human lives were being lost, continue to be lost, that perhaps, well, that, that need not be so. Specifically in the case of Hamas, that initiated this by throwing its rockets into Israel, and now we're seeing a, a, reaction, reaction. a reaction. Now you're saying it's disproportionate. Do you yes. believe it's disproportionate there, um, 
Yes, John? they haven't bombed enough. Oh, mm -hmm. um, they haven't bombed enough, you're that's saying? That's correct. I, I think they've been far too cautious. Um, the, the people who are being killed um, by Hamas, by, being lo by Hamas shooting from their location, and of course Hamas expects fully to be bombed in, in return and to have those people be killed. Um, those people, I mean, the, the question becomes, I mean, back it up for a second. It, there is a humanitarian crisis, yes. but that's the effect of something. And it's the effect of a war. The war is a war between, on one hand, uh, the forces of collectivism, and on the other hand, the forces of individualism, and it's the, those who do not want individualism that are causing this, and they're continually trying to provoke worldwide outrage against mm -hmm. the forces of individualism, Israel. Um, when, a, when a police officer uh, is, is found, uh, finds himself uh, in, at the you know, barrel of a gun, some bad guy's got a barrel of a gun pointed at him, and there's a, sh a human shield between the police officer and the bad guy. And there's just no way that the officer can survive without shooting through that shield. If the officer does that, if the officer does that to save his own life, the, the bullet for, came from the officer, did kill that shield, but the murderer was the person who was using that person as a human shield. We cannot go about saying that it's e even on both sides. The defender who, who shoots back at Hamas and takes out some uh, civilians uh, in the process is not at fault. Hamas is at fault. So it's, it's one thing to say humanitarian crisis, but we cannot forget to condemn the side that is responsible for it. And I think there is not enough uh, attacking of Hamas. I, need, I think they need to be entirely annihilated, not dealt with. We're here. What do we do with Hamas? So, uh, let me pick up on what you, you said. When you use the word and you uh, say that Hamas needs to be entirely annihilated, you're actually talking about the Palestinian people. Hamas is not a separate entity out there. They are not just a military entity. Hamas is the Palestinian people, and this is one of the reasons that no matter how often Israel goes in and bombs, saying that they're only looking for Hamas targets, they are going to be killing hundreds and thousands of innocent people, because that is who they are. They are they they're integrated into the Palestinian people. Uh, so you, so if what you are saying essentially is that all the Palestinians need to be annihilated. Now, while I agree with you, and I started off by saying that Israel has a right to exist and defend itself, but there are certain engagements that you have even in times of war. You, you, one has to know that, you know, uh, schools, for example, children, they are not collateral damage. They're innocent people. They're not combatants. And therefore, this is a very difficult situation. While okay, let's I make a separation here saying. between the Hamas combatants and the innocent civilians. There is a distinction to be made there. There is an, a distinction yes. to be made there, but the point that uh, that the Israeli army makes, the military makes, that they are there bombing just Hamas, is it doesn't work because they are the people. They are the Palestinian people, and when you talk about a chosen government, it doesn't matter how they chose them. Let me tell you that there is a corruption in elections all over the world, and we know that very well. So they are democratically elected. So it is something that that's not up for argument. They, yeah. It has to it has to be accepted. So instead of putting blame. And, and let's say for a moment we accept that Hamas is at fault. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have uh, fingered the lion, so to speak, because the lion will react. It will roar and then it will attack. And they knew that. Right. But is this really what, what, what they needed to do? Does, does Israel doesn't have to flex its mighty, mighty muscles and its military strength to the extent that continuously they need to hammer and kill people to make their point? Well, they're aiming at specific targets. Uh, schools? Well, yes. Well, no, not the schools. You see, well, if they're hiding behind the schools, and, and I'm still waiting for a logical answer here, because you're saying Hamas, well, they are the Palestinian people. However, Fatah once represented the Palestinian people. Well, so would you say parties, that they yes. are, would you of say course, the Palestinians say the are Fatah? The, yes, like but the, the liberal is, and conservative Well, you've got party. a government representing a people. They're, you've got a government, you've got civilians. Yes. And the Geneva Convention specifically separates civilians from those who were at war. Yes. Hamas is back. a group that's been identified by the international community as a terrorist group. They have been continuously throwing rockets into Israel, not the Palestinian people doing it. Hamas has been doing it. And I'm still waiting for a logical answer from anybody. How do you respond to a force like this? Y you bomb them. That's, it. that's the only answer. And, and the reason is that you first have to ask yourself, what is an innocent? Now, children, unfortunately, are caught in the in the, in the Yes, they situation. are, and that's the tragedy here. Right. Their parents yes. dictate where they're going to be at any given time. But an innocent person doesn't sit by idly while his countrymen are attacking another country offensively. 
they either attack their countrymen to, d to, to prevent themselves from being wrapped up in this mess, mm -hmm. or they flee the country. An innocent person doesn't just sit by while the next door neighbor is lobbing bombs into the next country. I mean, if I were in Niagara Falls and my next door neighbor were bombing Buffalo or whatever it is, whatever the closest uh, mm -hmm. location might be, and, and the American government says to me, hey, you Canadians better do something about this or we're going to attack. You want to bet I'm pulling out my gun and I'm shooting my next door neighbor. I am not going to sit by and, and allow it to be perceived that I'm on his side. And I am not innocent if I allow him to continue bombing uh, United States from, from Niagara Falls. Well, we're going to have to go for another break. Now, but when we come back, we're going to be talking about Sid Ryan, the president of the Canadian Union of Public Employees. Well, you may have seen it in the headlines, but Sid is very upset about this. He went so far as to propose, on behalf of that organization, a ban of all Israeli academics from Ontario universities. We want to hear how you feel about it. He's also compared Israel to the Nazis in what's going on now with the Middle East. And he's since apologized, saying he got a bit emotional. So we'll be talking more about this, and we want to hear what your thoughts are. Let us know. We'll be back after this. Stay tuned. <laughs> Again, and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're going to go on to subject matter number two. Before we do so, let's go now to Andy on line four. Hi, Andy, you're on the line. Yeah, hi, Christine, and hello to all your guests there. You're fabulous. Uh, anyways, very quickly, Golda Meir, my greatest female hero, okay? Anyway, she put it very succinctly. The, uh, the Palestinians never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity you know, and then close, you know, close brackets for peace. That's all I have to say. Andy, thanks for calling in. To be honest with you, I feel we were talking about the Palestinians during the break, and, I, and for the Palestinian people, I feel badly for them. I understand they're caught in the middle. Hamas has used them to their advantage, hiding behind these innocents as human shields. On the other hand, there's a reason why we're not hearing from neighbors like Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt. And that's something I want you to address. Well, Rahil, it's, you, it's, it's, this it's, is big for it's you. pathetic because these are these are the innocent people who are basically betrayed from both sides yes, by their are. own people mm -hmm. because of the infighting between the political parties. Well, there the Sunnis and, and the Shiites. And, uh, yes, and not not so much mm -hmm. the Sunnis and Shiites there because they're not that crisis is, that doesn't exist as much as the two parties, Hamas and Fatah. Yes. And of course, one thing that you have to also understand in terms of the election of Hamas that when Islamist parties come into power, they're never re-elected. Eventually, they themselves die out. We've just seen this in the Bangladeshi elections. So this is not an issue that, you know, the West needs to worry about. But what they do need to worry about is the fact that, you know, that when you said, said that, you know, if you know that there's going to be fire, you go somewhere, they have nowhere to go because the neighbors yes. are not are not helping them. So they need to, to, to pitch in and help broker a peace. I mean, this has got to stop, is what I'm saying. It doesn't matter what it takes, but the world has got to be. And, and let's not forget, Christine, the world is now a global village, you know. Anything that happens in that far part of the world impacts us because this is something that can become really big. And so it's, instead of taking sides and constantly lumping blame, we need to find a way to broker peace right now so that more lives are not lost on either side. You know, we've got to stop Hamas firing rockets into Israel yes. and we've got to mm -hmm. stop Israel from bombing uh, people where they're dying every day, every minute. Real, I'm curious what you're going to say about this because we're going back to the whole Sunni Shiite dynamic again. You're looking at Iran here in Syria, who have been blamed on men, in many reports, we see it in the media, for backing Hamas. Some are saying that the bigger threat is Iran, because these two are backing Hamas. But again, I, I know you don't like to take sides, because it's not necessarily about sides, but at the same time, it's part of that Mideast crisis dynamic. So you've got, you've, you've got those two, okay? Syria and Iran on one side, and you've got Egypt, Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and Jordan on the other. Yes. And right in the middle, you've got the Palestinians and, of course, the Israelis right now because yes. they're in a separate position. Mm -hmm. So it's all about this maneuvering to win over sides, to keep one's property, whatever it is. But the point of the matter is the Palestinians are stuck in the middle, it would seem. And although people have made it out to be 
and Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's much more than that. It is much more than that. And people need to understand yes. that because yes. you get one person being blamed, one particular yes. country. You want to comment on this? Well, I think it's fair to say it's in, it's, uh, most of those countries would prefer that Israel be gone. And uh, although they can't be as explicit about it as Hamas can, acting outside of a, of a government. Because I mean, you've got external partnerships with right. like Saudi Arabia I, and the States. They just don't admit it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, well, yeah, there they do, yes. I, but I mean, the, yes. the, the partnerships between Hamas and Iran, between, okay, so those won't be admitted and, and that way uh, other countries uh, get to do the, you know, have the, have, have, uh, uh, the Palestinian area take all of the, the uh, accountability for the bombs that go in there, mm -hmm. but actually it's just a launching ground for many different states it who is. would like to eliminate Israel. So, no, it's a, it's a conflict that is, uh, again, but again, you, I think it's a mistake to think of it as a, re a conflict of one religion versus a religion oh, no. or mm -hmm. one, per one people or race or whatever. But they are in the mix. It, it, and that's it's unfortunate. It's a fact. The, they are, are the in the hmm. mix and they do in get affected way. in a big mm -hmm. way outside of these areas. Yes. You see, again, yes. when, if you ever see the demonstrations outside the Israeli consulate and the, you know, when you see the Palestinians and the, the Israelis, you see that there is a lot of hate there because that's these right. things tend to spill over into religion, into ethnicity, into, And it's you spilled know, over into QP. And we're going to hear about that shortly. But <laughs> yes. first, let's okay. go to Mike on line six. Hello, Mike. You're on the line. Yes, good afternoon, people. I really enjoy the conversation that you're having there, for sure. Um, just, to, just to bring this back into some kind of historical perspective, we have to go back to the biblical roots of this whole thing, and that is the, uh, the initial conflict between Esau and Jacob, on, and, and Esau turning around and, and blaming Jacob for defrauding him of the, of the birthright of the firstborn. Unfortunately, these days, um, I don't believe from the Jewish people and the Muslims I've talked to that they even know what the, how the fight began and what it's all about, but... The bottom line is it's a spiritual conflict <clears throat> um, when Esau married into uh, Ishmael's uh, side uh, by marrying one of the daughters and the spirit of... Uh, Mike, yeah. thanks for your contribution. Let's go now to you, Gord, on line four. Hello, Gord, you're on the line. Hello, how are you? Fine, thanks. Yes, it seems like both sides made mistakes here. First of all, they sh uh, should have, the Americans and Israel should have recognized Hamas as the as elected uh, government. And either Hamas would have to change their spots and go for prosperity for the people or else give them enough rope to hang themselves. And also the other Arab countries, instead of giving weapons, they should have gave humanitarian aid and Egypt should have opened up its borders. And in prosperity, lots of time, usually people who are having a prosperous uh, uh, <clears throat> nation don't really usually want to go to war. And also, well, I thanks for calling in. I appreciate the shoulds here. There's a lot of should yes. that should be happening. <laughs> thanks for your call. Before we go for a break, because we're due for one, I still want to touch on the subject matter about the Canadian Union of Public Employees. Everybody has an opinion, but this organization is calling for, in our country, a boycott of Israeli academics in Ontario universities. Your view on that one? International uh, attempt at a Holocaust. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, it was, it was interesting. Sid Ryan likened the bombing of uh, a university in Palestine uh, to uh, the burning of books by the Nazis. You know, he, would, he should read the other part about what the Nazis did, which is where they banned all Jewish speakers from uh, universities, all Jewish professors. And this is exactly what Sid Ryan is calling upon. He wants anybody who takes the Israeli side not to be able to speak in a Canadian university. Well, what he said explicitly is that if, he, if, if any Israeli academic has not explicitly, yes, yes. explicitly condemned this, this retaliation that's going on in the Middle East, they need to be banned. Yes. My question for a person like Sid Ryan is, did he purport the same rule at 9-11 that all Islamic professors should be banned if they didn't explicitly condemn 9-11? I believe that this is a knee-jerk reaction, and he really has gone too far because academics, culture, and art should be totally beyond politicization. You know, I've always said, and I feel that a rocket fired from Palestine and a bomb thrown by Israel should not land in our university's backyards. So very simply, this academics should have absolutely no part of this, and I think that this was said in anger, or uh, he's apologized since then, but for, not for this. He's apologized not he's for the apologized for, ban, but for he's apologized for actually comparing yes. the Jews to the Nazis. We want to hear your thoughts on the subject matter. Whatever's touching you about the Middle East, we want to hear about it. Don't go away. We'll return after this. Stay tuned.
again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're continuing to talk about the crisis in the Middle East and we want to hear your thoughts on the matter. Right now we're continuing to discuss about QP and its role in trying to propose, well they have proposed, that a ban on all Israeli academics at Ontario universities. And the condition is unless they explicitly come out and openly condemn Israel's actions in the Middle East. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, oh, it's outrageous. I mean, it, the, the, the pretext for this is that, the, that Israel bombed a university uh, um, uh, in the Palestine, uh, Palestine area. This was a university, though. The context is this is a university that used to be funded by the communists that, you know, prior to the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall that um, has about a year, year and a half ago, was found to have been uh, a storage depot for weaponry found by the Palestinians, not by the Israelis, or not, but by the Palestinians uh, to have been a, a storage place for weaponry. So, the, and, and it is the central point for not only uh, uh, graduate, postgraduate degrees in a lot of the kind of pro-Hamas uh, stuff that we're, that we're seeing uh, propagated around the world. The organizations that are supporting these bans on Israel are usually, they usually have nothing to do with Palestine. They usually are leftist, pro-union, collectivist groups who have decided that they can capitalize on racist or other tribalist tensions around the world. And because they can't, you know, teach everybody what Karl Marx had to say about the proletariat and et cetera, they say, well, what's the next best thing we can do? Find any collective that's held together by their hatred of someone else, by their race, by their religion, and we'll put them together in the big brotherhood of collectivists. Sid Ryan and his CUPE members ought not to be doing anything outside the borders of Ontario. They're there to represent workers, not to be taking on international capitalism, which is exactly what he's trying to do by, by um, uh, like Sinn Féin, like these other various groups around the world that are, are taking the Gaza side, trying to badmouth Israel, when they know that Israel is the one location in the whole Middle East that is pro-Western, pro-individual rights life, liberty, property. It's a socialist state, it's a mixed economy, it's not, it's not my ideal state, but it's a far cry away from the, mm -hmm. uh, the collectivist daydream that, that uh, Sid Ryan would like to have us all living under, where nobody's mind matters, no one's opinion matters, the government doles out, takes from, takes from the productive, gives out to each according to their political whims. Um, where nobody's mind or opinion matters. That's absolutely disgraceful. Mm -hmm. And to capitalize upon this war, um, by bringing it home, and by the way, of course, there's an election in which he's going to be running again, I presume, for yes. president. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I can't help but believe that this group, and it's a, as I understand, a subgroup of CUPE, mm -hmm. it's only a thousand members or so, mm -hmm. but they have consistently uh, ele elected him. They did the same thing in 2006 when he proposed, or someone in his uh, uh, group proposed, a boycott on Israel, uh, even though Israel hardly sends any goods to Canada in the first place. It was largely symbolic. It's anti-Israeli, uh, as far as I'm concerned. If we are supporting Sid Ryan, we're supporting Hamas. We're supporting the exact same anti-individualistic, anti uh, frankly, anti-Jewish sentiments. I think it's disgraceful. And, and for anybody to be voting this guy in again, I, you know, they're as guilty as anybody sitting in, in Palestine right now. Okay, let's go to hear what you have to say now. Joseph on line six. Hello, Joseph. You're on the line. Yes, hi. G good afternoon. I'm, I'm happy to be here for the first time, and, and I don't really listen to, uh, to, to, to news very much. Uh, I'm just off on my son's uh, sickness because he just came out of hospital. I just want to say something quickly to Sid Ryan. Um, what you've just said, and even though you apologize, it's already gone out. Um, I think you should pack your suitcase, buddy. Fly. I got. I got a plane ticket for you. You could fly right there to 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 Lebanon uh, uh, and join the Hamad people and fight against Israel. Because what you just said is stupid. It just came out from your gut, and you can't uh, apologize for that already because it's gone out there and it's in people's head already. And you're you you're gone. You forget it. Joseph, thank you for calling in. I, I realize how you feel about that particular statement made by Sid Ryan, but. The major concern here, and I'd like, I'd like your opinion too, I, when you look at our economy, we've got enough to deal with here in Canada when you look at QP, the Canadian Union of Public Employees facing an economic downturn. I, I just thought his hands would be full 
yes. when it comes to dealing with the issues here. Now you've got York University yes. with, with, with professors. Oh, it's it's horrible. horrible. The students are being ripped off. And what about the students off? who paid their money for tuition? I mean, these are right. major concerns. Christine, at a time like this, one of the other reasons I'll say it's time for us to put on our Canadian caps. It's time for us yes. to stand up as Canadians and say that this kind of uh, posturing is not a Canadian, uh, you know, it, it's not something that we do as Canadians. We have an obligation, a moral and ethical obligation, mm -hmm. as one of the Western powers, to show compassion, to talk about justice and truth and to you know make remarks like he has done puts us actually in a very awkward position so I would say that we don't have grounds here as Canadians if at all we can do something we can broker peace you know I know it sounds like a tired record but you know we go back if, right. if a half-naked mm -hmm. man with a stick in India can bring peace and we have had mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela's and Martin Luther King's certainly peace can be brokered if both mm -hmm. sides want it yes well, Joseph, thanks for that call and what you said there. Very positive note. We're going to go for a break now. We'll return after this. Stay tuned. Hi. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. The next issue that we're talking about now, we're talking about the media coverage of the crisis in the Middle East. What do you think about it? Do you think it's been biased one side over the other? Do you think it's loaded with propaganda, for instance? The article that we have here, it's entitled The CNN Strategy. Now, interestingly enough, and this article is talking about this there. It was published in the National Post that Hamas itself called it the CNN Strategy. And what this article is referring to is for instance, the numbers that you're hearing, and I'm quoting this article here about the number of women and children getting killed in the, in the Palestinian territory as a result, well, in the Gaza, as a result of what Hamas has been doing and hiding behind these human shields. They're saying that those numbers are also including children that are part of the actual war effort, young soldiers and women that are also terrorists, according to this article, so the numbers are inflated. They're also saying that the pictures that you're seeing are also being used for propaganda. And from the other po side point of view, we don't see pictures of the Israelis getting killed. The reason why is the Jews do not, they don't, they don't show their dead. It's part of their culture and their religion. The dead is usually buried within 24 hours of death. So you're not going to see media images of the dead in Israel. Do you think it's been biased? I, I'd like to hear what the two of you think, because to be honest with you, I, some t in certain media outlets, you might expect more of a bias than you're actually seeing, to be honest. So I'd like to hear what the two of you have to say about this. Do you think it has been? Let's start with you on this one, Paul. Yeah, I think it is. And I, and I know that uh, Dershowitz, in the, the one article we, we were looking at, he's, he's pointing out very, uh, boy, is he ever being politically correct, but mm -hmm. um, in a nice way. He, he's trying not to come out and say it. But what he's saying is that the whole world tolerates this kind of one-sidedness. It tolerates and even encourages this idea that uh, look at the, 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 the poor uh, the Palestine, uh, Palestinian child uh, and, and we, they never expect to see the dead um, in Israel. They never expect to see the dead uh, that were caused by mm -hmm. Hamas within their own territory. For example, friendly fire and etc. And, and I think what he's getting at, without coming right out and saying it, because maybe he thinks it's self-serving, I don't think it would be, is that I think what this whole conflict re uh, reveals worldwide is that a disgraceful fact that far too many of us outside of the Middle East included, especially, uh, have this uh, latent anti-Semitism, this hatred of Jews, and it, it's th therefore much easier to, uh, to pin the tail on the... Uh, on the Jews and say that they're the, they're the, the uh, problem makers here because no one goes any further than how much they dislike Jewish people. I think it's disgraceful and it, it, it ties in. It ties in with this whole idea of Western values in Israel because what are Western values? They're trade and free trade and capitalism. And who gets blamed for what capitalism and banking? Well, it, everyone just talks about, you know, Shakespeare's Shylock money trader, you know, and it's the whole idea of money and Jewish and banking and capitalism gets wrapped up in this emotional anti-Western, anti-capitalist, anti-Israel feeling. And it becomes possible at that point to hate Jews for anything. Just give people an excuse to blame Israel and We're they'll do it. We're also sickened though in the West, and this comes out in this article, we're sickened in the West by seeing children dead. And that gets played up. And that's one thing that 
this article addresses too. This is just some, not something that we're accustomed to, thankfully. Yes, well, I, I totally disagree with Paul here, and I guess I have the freedom to do of so. Course. First of all, you know, Paul, when you, you use do. cliche terms like Western values, etc., etc., you have to understand the West is not no longer just a Judeo-Christian um, situation. I mean, you know, there are as many, if not more, Muslims living in the West now than there are Jews. So, you know, that certainly doesn't apply in terms of Western values just being the values of one people. Second, media has always been biased before and after this crisis I mean there every me whoever thought that media was objective and I say this sort of straddling both places as the public and as media myself there is always a bias if I present something there is a bias let's not forget and go back not too far that when the Americans were in Iraq the only images that you saw more and more was of the Americans there so whoever is presenting and seeing and especially gives not the complete picture and therefore the best way I have found to understand what's happening in a crisis is to go across the board you know CCNN CBC BBC and then of course Al Jazeera has its own agenda and its own uh, bias so the biases are there but that doesn't stop us today with the internet I mean, I have been in correspondence with an organization called Physicians for Humans, Human yes. Rights in Gaza, and they're giving me statistics, not pictures of the dead, but statistics of what the medical situation is, of, you know, the lack of ambulances, what they need, what is happening to the... To the uh, the wounded people that they are taking. That's not propaganda. That's not a bias. That is a reality. And majorly, journalists haven't been allowed in Gaza. So what is being presented and said is everyone's own opinion. So I would say, yes, there is a bias, but there is a bias on both sides. And dead children are dead children. And it is a terrible thing to see. It doesn't matter whose dead child it is. It is always something very terrible to see. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's dead and dying. So we need to feel that compassion. How else are we going to be able to deal with this situation? How else are we going to bring out Rahil, the human I agree with us? you there. We need, we need to feel the compassion. <clears throat> yes. But we only see one side. What, and I, I'm not against. I, I'm not against the reality of it because it's a sickening, sad thing when children are dying. But, we, but when people are only seeing one side and they're not seeing the dead on the other side, that influences people. We want to hear your thoughts. We'll get to you after the break. Stay tuned. Hello again, and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Let's go now to you, Paramajit, on Line 6. Hello, you're on the line. Yes, Mr. Thank you very much for that. I, I just wish to make very three, uh, com uh, uh, three comments and very shortly. Please make it short. Yeah, and in the first place, it's about this uh, media coverage uh, of the, mm -hmm. uh, the Gaza uh, the problem. We have never, never seen what is the effect of the, uh, the rockets which go into the Israeli territory. It's never described. It's never seen. And yet CNN and all those, you know, big names, they show all this stuff, what's happening in Palestine. It is absolutely one-sided uh, display. Harimajit, thanks for calling in and sharing your view. Let's go now to Grace on line seven. Hi, Grace. You're on the line. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Grace. Yeah. Um, that we're seeing in b between Palestine and um, Israel is that... Uh, uh, Hamas is a part of um, being elected by the Palestinian people, and uh, uh, it is uh, have to be debate each other. You can't be bomb people. You can't go neighbor. They are their home. I know Israel people. They are home. They, these people is their home. Before Israel, uh, since Noah been over there, and then they have to use the Ten Commandments, live one another, and the. Children of list and even they can't throw any. Uh... Grace, we're running out of time. Thanks for calling in. Something a key I want to something very key I want to finish on though, and it, it's something that you said, Raheel, about I agree. We're no longer a country that's made up of only Christians and Jews anymore, Judeo-Christian. However, we're founded on the, the principles and the values enshrined in our constitution, respecting our democracy, the fathers of confederacy. This was the foundation of our country and people like you that come here, like me, all immigrants, everybody who flocked here had an appreciation and a respect for that. And I know as many peace-loving Muslims and, and people from other parts of the world that appreciate this. But it's not to say that we're not, we don't have a lot of other people, if you just want to answer to that quickly. Well, of course. Yes. I mean, I have been among the people who's always respected exactly. the, the exactly. Judeo-Christian foundation of this country. That's mm -hmm. why they call me the Merry Muslim. <laughs> but, but at the same time, I'm mm -hmm. saying, if you look at statistics, when people yes. speak of the West, mm -hmm. they can't speak 
speak of the West in isolation only, yes. because now the West constitutes and every ethnicity. We must end on that note. Thank you both so much for joining me. That's all the time we have. See you again next time. I'm Christine Williams, and from all of us, thank you for watching.